Of all the various types of sedimentary rocks in the world, terrigenous rocks are by far the most abundant and common. They account for the vast majority, perhaps 80 to 85 percent, of all sedimentary rocks in the world by volume. These rocks, of course, are known by another name, siliciclastic. They consist almost entirely of silica in the form of silicate minerals like quartz, feldspar, mica, and clay. These minerals occur in particles or clasts derived from weathering and erosion of pre-existing rocks. Although they sometimes contain biogenous and hydrogenous sediment, terrigenous rocks mainly consist of lithic fragments of igneous, metamorphic, and other sedimentary rocks. So they are clastic rocks. At this point, you already know a thing or two about the different types of terrigenous rocks. You know breccia and conglomerate, sandstone, siltstone, claystone, and shale. These rocks are distinguished by their textures, the shapes and sizes of their grains. The terrigenous rocks with the largest clasts are called breccia and conglomerates. In both cases, the rocks are poorly sorted. The largest clasts are pebble or cobble-sized. The only difference between a breccia and a conglomerate is the shape of the clasts. Conglomerate clasts are well-rounded. Breccia clasts, in contrast, are angular in shape. Sandstone, like breccia and conglomerate, is a coarse-grained rock. You can see and feel the clasts. Sandstone has a texture like sandpaper. The clasts themselves may be angular, rounded, poorly sorted, or well-sorted. It would not be out of the question to call it a well-sorted sandstone or angular sandstone. As we begin looking at the terrigenous rocks with smaller clasts, it becomes more challenging to see the grains. Siltstone consists of silt-sized clasts, meaning it's a fine grain rock. You can hardly even feel or see the clasts at all. The best way to identify a siltstone is to look at it under a microscope. But if you are in a real pinch, there is another easier way too. All you have to do is break off a little chip of the rock and nibble on it a little bit. If it feels gritty against your teeth, it's probably a siltstone. The clastic rocks with the smallest clay-sized clasts are naturally called claystones. You can nibble on these rocks all day long. You won't feel any grit on your teeth. Clay-sized particles are simply too small. Now, let's take things to the next level. Naturally, all of these rocks are more complicated than they appear at first glance. Not to mention, there are variations of each type. Take conglomerate, for example. Conglomerate rock is sometimes called rudite. The terms are used interchangeably. In one of these rocks, you can potentially find clasts ranging in size from clay-sized grains that you can only see with an electron microscope to pebble and cobble-sized grains that you can see with the naked eye. In cases where you have a mix of both, we refer to the finer material located between the large clasts as the matrix. Whereas the clasts may be pebbles or cobbles, the matrix can consist of clay, silt, and sand-sized grains. 
You may even use the composition of the matrix to help you describe the lithology of the rock. For example, if the matrix consists of sand, then you can call it a sandy conglomerate. It is customary to try and include as much information as possible in the description of a, of a rock and its lithology. With this in mind, we can go one step further. Some conglomerates contain more clasts, whereas others primarily consist of matrix. If the large clasts all tend to touch each other through the rock, then we call it a clasped supported conglomerate or ortho conglomerate. Conversely, if most of the clasts are completely surrounded by matrix, then we say that it is a matrix supported conglomerate or para conglomerate. The best way to determine if a conglomerate is a clasped or matrix supported rock is to prepare it as a petrographic thin section for microscopic analysis. When you study it under the microscope, you will be able to clearly differentiate between clasts and matrix and see how the two compare. Sandstones are equally, if not more complex. Many of the concepts that apply to conglomerates also apply to sandstones. Sand sized grains are defined as clasts between 63 micrometers and 2 millimeters in diameter, meaning that they can be felt but are generally difficult to see without the aid of a hand lens or microscope. Like conglomerate, sandstone can also contain smaller particles of silt and clay, which again, we call the matrix. Because of their size, the silt and clay size grains in the matrix cannot be observed without the use of a microscope. In most sandstones, the majority of the sand sized clasts are lithic fragments produced through weathering and erosion of pre existing rocks. Here, you can see a petrographic thin section of a sandstone containing clasts of volcanic rock. Typically, you also find that many of the particles in sandstone are mineral grains made of quartz or feldspar. Other minerals will also be present in small amounts. It is not unusual to describe a sandstone based on the occurrence of these minerals that help to distinguish it. That said, there are better ways to classify a sandstone. One of the most useful classifications of sandstone is called the Pettijohn classification. It might also be helpful to you to remember it as the Toblerone classification scheme. This classification scheme distinguishes between sandstones based on their percentages of matrix and clasts of various types. It relies on the use of ternary plots, which are triangular diagrams like this one. Each plot graphically depicts the ratio of three variables, which sum to a constant. In this case, the variables are the amounts of lithic fragments, quartz mineral grains, and feldspar mineral grains in a sandstone like this one. If we study the grains in this sandstone, we will find that, generally speaking, the numbers of lithic fragments and quartz and feldspar mineral grains total to 100%. If all of the particles occur in equal amounts, we can graph the sandstone in the middle of the ternary plot. Conversely, if all of the particles are quartz mineral grains, we would put it at the top of the plot. 
And if there were equal amounts of quartz and feldspar grains, but no lithic fragments, it would fall somewhere along the left side of the plot. Other sandstones may have other combinations of particles. In any case, a ternary plot like this one allows you to visualize the variation that exists among different sandstones. The Pettyjohn scheme uses three ternary diagrams representing a continuum of sandstones going from class supported sandstones on one end of the spectrum to matrix supported sandstones on the other end of the spectrum. In this framework, we can use the Toblerone plot to differentiate between sandstones of various compositions, textures, and fabrics. If a sandstone mainly consists of clasts and contains very little matrix, then we call it an aronite. Aronites are your classic sandstones. They have the grainy look and feel of a sandstone. By the numbers, an aronite is less than 15% matrix. So under a microscope, you usually find and see a lot of large clasts like bees. If a sandstone contains a lot of matrix material instead, then we call it a wacky. You will also sometimes see them called gray wackies because of their color. Wackies are generally not what you picture when you think of a sandstone. By the numbers, they are anywhere from 15 to 75% matrix. There may be more silt and clay in a wacky than sand. As a result, wackies tend to have a smoother feel than aronites, and the grains aren't always easy to spot either. Using the Toblerone plot, we can further classify aronites and wackies based on their mineral grains and clasts. For example, if a sandstone primarily consists of feldspar mineral grains, then we might call it an Arcos aronite or feldspathic wacky, as opposed to a lithic or quartz wacky or aronite. If a rock primarily consists of silt and clay size grains, or more than 75% matrix, we call it a mud rock. Mud rock represents nearly 60% of all sedimentary rock and the vast majority of terrigenous rocks as a whole. In this sense, we use the term mud to describe any sediment composed of silt or clay sized grains. Of course, when it comes to the rock, we can usually go further than that. If more than two thirds of a mud rock consists of silt sized grains, then we call it a siltstone. Likewise, if two thirds of the particles on a mud rock are clay sized, then we call it a clay stone. If the mud rock includes a mix of clay and silt, you will sometimes see it called a mudstone. However, you should avoid this term if possible because some carbonate rocks are also called mudstones. If absolutely necessary, you should refer to the rock as a terrigenous or siliciclastic mudstone to avoid confusion. You are also bound to encounter the word shale. This word is commonly used to describe any mud rock. However, some geologists believe the term should only be applied to fissile mud rocks. A fissile rock has a strong tendency to break in one direction 
parallel to the bedding plane. You will know a fissile shale when you see it. When a fissile shale is weathered, it tends to produce many thin wood chip like pieces. For this reason, fissile shales are notoriously difficult to study. They just crumble as a result of weathering activity. The best places to study shales are new exposures, which have not undergone extensive weathering. In summation, terrigenous rocks exhibit an incredible amount of variation. Yes, they vary in terms of the sizes of their grains, but they also vary with regard to their ratios of clasts and matrix material and the compositions of the grains themselves. Sedimentary geologists require, in some cases, very complex classification schemes to help them differentiate between different types of terrigenous rocks. As you push forward, you should work on learning these classification schemes and how to apply them to real rocks. They are ultimately the key to doing science and research in sedimentology and stratigraphy.